Hi everybody, just when you thought you'd <laughs> had enough of me for one day. Um, in the live chat, which um, unfortunately didn't happen yesterday because um, as I suspected, um, sleep deprivation took over and caused Eric Cozy to nap after he'd had something to, to eat. And he left a voice message on my phone at about midnight to say, really sorry, um, thought it was going to be four o'clock his time. Well, four o'clock his time is midnight. Um, so anyway, he is, he is forgiven. Um, he was, uh, um, as I say, been really uh, burnt out over the last couple of weeks. So uh, we'll, we'll let him off. Um, looking back on the Anne Sekoulis case, one of the aspects of it that I never mentioned, that her attorney is um, this, this lunatic called Jeffries, Jeffress. And he quoted that, um, what's well, quoted in, in, in the article, that Jeffress had, has previously said that her client would not return voluntarily to the UK. Quote, this was an accident and a criminal prosecution with a potential penalty of 14 years imprisonment is simply not a proportionate response, Jeffers said last month. I, I take huge exception at anybody in America trying to suggest that here in the UK we are unnecessarily harsh in terms of prison sentence when you know, coming from the United States, where in some states they execute people. Um, no, Jeffers, you need to get your facts right. If she, when she, not if, when she comes back to the UK, there will be a, a hearing and all the mitigating circumstances will be taken into account. The 14 years imprisonment is for deliberate, reckless driving. It was clearly an accident. She will face somewhere between two to five years, is my best estimate. But... As I say, isn't it typical how lawyers will twist, twist the, tr the, the truth and try and come up with, with their own narrative on it? Um, there was a um, so there was a reply from Rad Seeger. He is the spokesman for the Dunn family, and he said that they, in terms of the um, non extradition of Anne Skoulis, uh, he, he said that they will not stand for it in reaction to the decision not to extradite Sekoulis. He posted the comment on Twitter early Friday UK time. Don't worry, don't you worry, Harry Dunn supporters. Taking this in our stride, and Sekoulis is coming back. You won't stand for it. We won't. British government won't. Next steps to be discussed and agreed. As I say, it's pretty bizarre. Um, that, that, was, that was, for me, one of the most offensive things. This idea that somehow, you know, you can't send her back to the UK. It's one of these barbaric third world countries. Um, you know, <laughs> we had our jet at justice back in the 1700s. We are, <laughs> and in terms of prison sentences, we are nowhere near as harsh. In fact, some of you will recall that one of our supporters is, is a guy called Scott Ellis. And his son, Bryant, accidentally shot and killed his friend um, and has received a 20-year prison sentence. And in the same time frame, a, a, a much wealthier person with no connection to um, any connection at all to the Avery family um, killed somebody whilst driving and received two years. Yes, they're both accidents, but we want um, parity, don't we, you know? When Antikoulis gets back, nobody's wanting to throw into jail for 14 years. We accept it was an accident. Here in the UK, we actually have, unfortunately, quite a few elderly people that go the wrong way, particularly down slip roads, down ramps, as you call them, onto the wrong side of the dual carriageway. It, it, it happens regularly, and we regularly in the borders, we see motorists not understanding which way round to go round, say a roundabout. You just have to watch out for them. You notice that they've got the foreign plates, you watch out for them. Whether, of course, the car Seculus was driving had those particular plates on, it wouldn't really matter. 
From what I gather, she simply came straight out of the, the airbase and straight into the path of the motorcyclist. Um, yes, it's an accident. These things happen. What's re really annoying is the fact that, um, a bit like the, the Ricky Hoxtetler case, it's it's a tragic accident. You know, um, you know, ev everybody is so sad about this. Um, so therefore, let, let's just let's just brush it under the carpet and just just leave it at that. Okay, so. Um, what else did we um, notice recently? Well, Travis sent me a Twitter, a tweet by the Twittering Mr. Let me get it, Stephen Drizzen. Let's find it. It's here somewhere. And a lot of chat. Here we go, here we go. A Stephen Drizzen uh, on Twitter. Let's have a look and see what he says. And it's and it's funny, isn't it? Sometimes how you know you you sort of re read read a comment, and you think maybe he's thinking of me. He put in his um, tweet, "Keep an eye on this case and this ruling." Doctor Ofshe, Kassan, and Leo, Doctor Ofshe's student back in the day are the three false confession experts who literally created the field. I count all three as mentors. So what is the article? Let's have a look at the article. I had to look up where Livingston County was. Livingston County is in Michigan, has a population of about 180,000, so it's about 100,000 bigger than Manitowoc County. Judge hears arguments for stroke against expert witness in interrogations. Dated January the 2nd, 2020. Arguments for and against a potential expert witness in the upcoming retrial of Jerome Kowalski were heard in Livingston County Court Tuesday. In 2013, Jerome Kowalski was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the double murders of his brother and sister-in-law. Last year, that conviction was vacated following the revelation that former District Court Judge Teresa Brennan, who presided over the case, was having an inappropriate relationship with the lead prosecution witness. You can't make this stuff up, can you? One of the issues that the Kowalski family had within the first trial was Brennan's disallowance of an expert witness on false confessions. According to Kowalski's son, Jared, his father suffered from alcoholism and withdrawals. And upon threats to bring his family in for interrogation, confessed to the crimes. For the retrial, Kowalski's defence is aiming to have Dr. Richard Ofshe, as Steve has mentioned, the teacher of Richard Leo, an expert in police interrogations to testify. Shiawasi, I hope I've got that right, <laughs> County Circuit Court Judge Matthew Stewart, who is presiding over the new case, oversaw a Dorbert hearing Tuesday, Dorbert is a place I presume, hearing Tuesday considering arguments for and against Ofshi's qualifications as a witness. Ofshi explained his area of expertise and experience in reviewing, he says, 1,500 interrogations over his career. He said that he evaluates in the interrogation and the tactics and manoeuvres that the interrogators use to move the suspect who almost invariably starts at the position I didn't do this and ends up at the end of the, invest the interrogation with some form of I did it statement. Ofshi says he does not offer nor ever has testified opinion as to believing whether or not a suspect's confession is false or true, 
but rather equips the jury with information they often don't have to make that decision for themselves. He says the Reed technique that nearly all interrogators use has been proven to draw false confessions, particularly when DNA is available to be studied. And that part of his job is to educate the jurors on the technique. However, prosecutors doubted Offshee's ability to stay neutral. Assistant Prosecutor Michael Taylor found verbiage on a court document with Offshee believing that false confessions happened regularly and with significant frequency, misleading in that those words would steer jurors to believe they happen all the time. Offshee argued it was a matter of perspective and that 10 to 15% of the time could be considered significant. The prosecution also pointed to several cases of Ofstry's testimony being dismissed in other trials. So it seems as if the, certainly when it comes to um, experts at trials, some people just don't want to listen. Um, Judge Stewart confirmed with Ofshi that his testimony has been accepted in roughly 400 state, federal and military cases in 39 states, including one last week in Tennessee. Prosecutors and Kowalowski's defence will submit written closing arguments with Judge Stewart, issuing his decision at a later time. The retrial is tentatively scheduled to begin on June 15th. So it seems as if sometimes it's still difficult to get people who are hell-bent on preserving a conviction based on a false confession. They are still determined to carry on with that. Now, me, of course, I um, when I saw that, I kind of took exception to the... Thing that the guy had said um, that um, prosecution attorney um, Michael Taylor when he um, prosecutors doubted of she's ability to stay neutral assistant prosecutor Michael Taylor found verb verbiage on a court document with Ofshi, believing that false confessions happened quote regularly and with significant frequency he found these misleading in that those words would steer jurors, jurors to believe they happen all the time. <laughs> Offshore, of course, pointed out, well, a matter of perspective. If you've got 10 to 15 percent of the time, that is considered significant. Me, I couldn't help. But uh, let's see, there we go. <laughs> it reminded me of the... Um, I mean, I, I use the name Chopin. It was actually my Uncle Chris that had this, this situation. Um, he was invited to go and play at a, at a hall, um, uh, to, you know, to go along and play piano, and that they had a piano there, so that was fine. So he went along, and he took one look at the piano and said, a, a piano, by the way, typically has um, 88 keys, okay? He said, I can't play on that. There's a dozen keys missing. <laughs> to which the, <laughs> the guy from the hall said, what's your problem? There's plenty more. Absolutely ludicrous. You know, 10 to 15%. It's, 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 it's a hugely significant figure. Um, and to try and downplay that, um, it just so shows, as I say, this, this determination by some people, um, <laughs> prosecutors, from a political point of view, um, they really don't like to be having having to accept that something was done wrong. I, I think what's particularly striking when you look at more and more and more of these wrongful convictions is how often does somebody involved in that in that wrongful conviction actually is, issue any kind of apology? You know, um, Tom Kaczurek. Robert Herman, they described the 85 wrongful conviction of Stephen Avery as unfortunate. <laughs> we know exactly who they are referring to when they consider it unfortunate. They're considering it unfortunate to themselves. 
that they had to that he had to be released. Anyway, I thought I would just share those quickly with you. And just a, another re reminder that um, this coming weekend we're looking forward to having a a, um, a present a, a video on Eric Cozy's channel with uh, screenshots and everything. That's why we're doing it on his channel because he's got the technology to do that. Um, with Magilla, a redditor, to do with the um, the scent dogs, the bones, um, and a lot of interesting, very interesting things about the case, which um, which obviously he's he's looked into because of his field of expertise. So anyway, um, I'll keep reminding you. Uh, but as I say, something to look forward to at the at the weekend on Sunday night, I believe, before Super Bowl. Um, tune in onto Eric Cozy's channel. Anyway, um, I'll share the um, article, the, the newspaper article about this, um, this case in the link below. Um, either that or I, I might even actually simply put in the, the Steve Drizzen tweet, the link to the tweet, and then you can look at it, okay? So anyway, catch you soon. Bye for now.